<clears throat> we appreciate having each of you with us today. We always, this time of the year, of course, we inevitably have quite a few that are always that are on the road traveling or visiting in some other location. So visitors especially appreciated, and we are certainly glad that you're here with us today. When we look at this particular lesson today, it's taken from the Sermon on the Mount. We've been using that on Wednesday night, and <clears throat> this is somewhat a continuation of it. This is probably one of the, uh, I guess you'd say, best things that you can find scripture-wise to build sermons from because it contains so much information that is important. The lesson today is one that uh, that I think will help to answer perhaps some questions that you might have, but we'll get into that later. The study of the Old Testament in particular is important to us because as Paul wrote in Romans 15, 4, everything written long ago was written to teach us so that we would have confidence through the endurance and encouragement which the scriptures give us. In other words, the Old Testament is there and it provides a, a real basis on which we can find the things that we need to know in our time. As we've mentioned before, God really hasn't changed in his approach to things. His ideas and his desires have always been the same, but he has to have approached it from a variety of different ways, primarily because of the fact that it took men uh, some time to catch on to exactly what God wanted done. So as we, as we look at this and as we think about it, and as we read earlier uh, from the fifth chapter of Matthew, that Jesus' statement was that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. In Romans 3 and verse 31, we find, are we abolishing Moses' teachings by his faith? Thinking, uh, that's unthinkable. Rather, we are supporting Moses' teachings. Many Christians don't really recognize the fact that the Old Testament law, the law of Moses, was still being uh, dealt with during the time when Jesus was there and even during the time of the, the early in the first century when the church was being established. And the ideas that are there are ones, as Paul set forth in Romans 15:4 that were important to be understood because these ideas uh, are basically what God wants. And as an example of that, in looking at it, we have the seventh chapter of Matthew, which again is another part of the Sermon on the Mount, and the 12th verse, which is probably one of the better known passages of scripture. Always do the other people, to, for other people, everything you want them to do for you. That is the meaning of Moses' teaching and the prophets. Notice in particular in the, the Matthew's approach to this that he points out that this was the teaching of Moses and the prophets. I don't think that many Christians really stop to think about the fact that this uh, loving your neighbor was something that was from the Old Testament. Of course, Luke wrote about it in the sixth chapter and 31st verse in a more limited fashion when he said, do, do for other people everything you want them to do for you. But this all stems initially from the Old Testament in Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Never get revenge, never hold a grudge against any of your people. Instead, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am the Lord. So when you begin looking at passages of scripture like this, you begin to recognize and realize that the things that were stated in the Old Testament and Moses' law are still things that are important for us to be aware of today because they are still part of what the Lord expects. He hasn't really changed that much. He has uh, made some significant changes from the standpoint that the law and the prophets primarily uh, did a particular thing as far as, as we are concerned. They, in the old covenant, in recognizing and thinking about it, it set forth standards by which individuals were to live. In other words, you had the law that said, thou shalt, thou shalt not. What it could do was point out to you where you failed. That was the primary thrust of it. And it ultimately did not really offer a real avenue of salvation. Because under the old covenant, it was necessary for the high priest to go once a year 
into the Holy of Holies and to offer a sacrifice for the entire nation of Israel. And of course, in those times, we were only dealing with the nation of Israel. They were the God's chosen people. So when you look at this, you have to recognize that, that God is making a progression from that particular approach to opening the door for all men to have an opportunity of salvation. But nevertheless, in looking at these things and, and thinking about them, uh, it's important for us to realize some other things about the statement that we just made that uh, we see from both the Old and the New Testament. When it says to love your neighbor as yourself, it teaches several things. One of the things it says is, don't lie. That's not the way you want to be treated, so you, you don't lie. You don't steal. You, d and in the, you don't do things that will be harmful or hurtful to other people. These are just some of the things that we really don't stop to think about when you read a passage that says you're to treat other people as you'd like to be treated yourself. But when you think about it, you realize that this is very fundamental. This, this is, encompasses basically most of what God commands. Because if we do the things the way God would have us to do them, then we, we find things going the way God wants them to be. In Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, Jesus answered him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All of Moses' teachings and the prophets depend on these two commandments. So when we look at it and see passages like this, this tells us that what Jesus was telling us to do today is basically the same identical things that were taught under the Mosaic Law. And in fact, points out the fact that most people are familiar with the Ten Commandments, but the reality is you can take these two commandments, which Jesus said were the greatest ones, and they encompass everything that is in the Ten Commandments. They give you everything that you need to know in order to do what God wants you to do. You love God, you treat your fellow man like you want to be treated, and the bottom line and the end result is that everything is done in a way that is pleasing to God. So this was the teaching from the Old Testament. And Jesus has simply brought it forward and expanded upon it and made it so that we could recognize and, and see what is there. And the reason for this, if Paul points out in Romans 13, 8, pay your debts as they come due. However, one debt you can never finish paying is the debt of love that you owe each other. The one who loves another person has fulfilled Moses' teachings. So from the very beginning, this has been the way in which you fulfill the teachings that God has given. That when individuals love and care about one another, then you're doing what God wants done. And if you stop and think about what John told the first century church was that the identifying characteristic of Christians was to be their love for one another. So it's important to recognize that love is an important factor. However, Christians tend to make a mistake about this. Because Jesus taught about love and understanding, people begin to think that, well, He's, a, he's good and understanding and he loves me and he cares about me. And so I can, you know, I can, don't have to really be too strict about how I hold on to the things that he would have me to do because he loves me. And if someone loves you, they'll overlook your faults. Unfortunately, in thinking about this gets us into trouble because then we begin to think that we can get by with things just because the Lord loves us and Jesus made the sacrifice he did. But the reality is, is that we still have the responsibility to do the things that the Lord wants done. In the Matthew 5 and 17, which we referred to earlier, don't ever think that I came to set aside Moses' teachings or the prophets. I didn't set, come to set them aside, but to make them come true. A lot of people have a difficulty understanding what is meant when Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law. They say, well, the law was taken out of the way, as the First Corinthians tells us, when it was nailed to the cross with Christ, when it died at the cross of Calvary, that the law was finished at that particular point. 
And as far as a system by which uh, the people were to serve God, that's true, it was. The Mosaic system was done away. No more offering burnt sacrifices or having to go to the temple in Jerusalem in order to, to do your, your obedience to the Lord, to offer your sacrifices for sins that were committed or to do any of these other things, to pay your obligations to the Lord. All of that changed and we became a royal priesthood, as Peter tells us, so that we now have the responsibility of, of conducting ourselves in a way so that we can worship God actually wherever we are. Since we are all priests, therefore we are able to offer our sacrifices and our praise to God wherever we are, whether it's in a building or under a tree or wherever it might be. So Christ has expanded the, the application of the systems that Moses taught and made them come to forward to make them uh, something that functions and works for us. He came to fulfill, and the word for that in the Greek literally means to finish or to complete or to fill up. So his job was to finish or complete or make full or make plain uh, the ideas that were set forth in, under the Mosaic Covenant. And this, of course, is precisely what Jesus did. He became our example. In Romans 10 and verse 4, Paul wrote, Christ is the fulfillment of Moses' teaching so that everyone who has faith may receive God's approval. So God wanted the message that he had intended for men to receive to be revealed, and he sent Christ to do that. Christ was here to present the things that God wanted us to understand. That was his responsibility. In other words, he came to offer a way of salvation to men that had not been available before. The door had not really been opened as far as Gentiles were concerned prior to Christ's coming. There was, of course, a way when individuals could obey what God wanted done. And then, of course, when uh, John the Baptist came, that also offered an opportunity for salvation. But the reality is that the primary opening of the door didn't take place until the day of Pentecost when Peter preached the, the first sermon there and 3,000 individuals responded to it. So Moses' law, though, was necessary in order to give us the opportunity to, to make the progression that we had to make or had to be made in order to bring us to the point where we could understand what God wanted and it would be clear to everyone. And in uh, Galatians 3 and verse 24, before Christ came, Moses' law served as our guardian. Christ came so that we could receive God's approval by faith. So, as we said before, the Mosaic Law was a good law from the standpoint that it told people what to do in order to be approved by God. But it did not really offer anything from a, what we might say a positive standpoint for the individual to do what God really wanted done. It was, uh, it was words and rules. Uh, it wasn't, it really didn't have a, a let's say, a, an understanding characteristic about it. It was just, this is the law, and this is what you do in order to be approved. And if you don't do that, then you will be condemned. So it was just words, basically, and rules that were given. There was no real example to it. Uh, and Christ becomes the living picture of what the Mosaic Law was, and in that way, he was fulfilling it. In 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23, God called you to endure suffering because Christ suffered for you. He left you an example so that you could follow in his footsteps. Christ never committed any sin. He never spoke deceitfully. Christ never verbally abused those who verbally abused him. When he suffered, he did not make any threats, but left everyone, everything to the one who judges fairly. So under the Mosaic law, you have these, all these rules that are set forth, but no one was ever able to live according to the rules that were set forth. Men were not capable of doing it. So Christ comes, and what he does is demonstrate that it is possible to live according to what God's commands are. And as a result of doing that, he becomes the example for us all. He becomes the pattern by which we can follow in doing the things that God would have us to do.
and by demonstrating our faith and our belief and our trust in him, then we have the opportunity to be all that we can be as far as the Lord is concerned because we let Christ be our example and he also, of course, is, is the way in which we have received faith and that we have the hope of salvation. In Galatians 3.25-27, through 27, But now that this faith has come, we are no longer under the control of the guardian. You are all God's children by believing in Christ Jesus. Clearly, all of you who were baptized in Christ's name have clothed yourself with Christ. In other words, when individuals become Christians, when they are immersed into the in the waters of baptism, as Acts 22, 16 says, your sins are taken away, they are washed away, and as a result of that, as Galatians 3 tells us, you put on Christ, because in Christ there is salvation. Outside of Christ there is no salvation. So this is how you were born again of water and the Spirit that John 3, 5, and 6 talks about. This is the process by which it takes place. And so it's important that we understand that Christ came to provide a way of salvation. And in this way, he fulfilled the law. God's desire always was for all men to be saved. God never has never been in the position in which he wanted all of his creation to be lost and to go contrary to his will. His desire has always been for all mankind to be saved. But he had to progress through several stages in order to get to the point where men could understand what they wanted. Christ came and he revealed what God wanted done and the way in which we could do it in order to be acceptable and accomplish the purposes that he would have us to. So Christ was the answer that came and provided us with a way by which we might be saved. So it's important for us to really understand and recognize that Christ was the fulfiller of the Mosaic law. He was the one that filled it up. It was as a result of the sacrifice that he made because the, the forgiveness of sins, the Hebrew writer tells us that the forgiveness of sins, the shedding of blood is necessary for the forgiveness of sin. Now, people will say, well, why is that necessary? Uh, I couldn't tell you other than the fact that God says that it is, that somehow or other the life is in the blood, we're told that, but the reality is that God, through his uh, inspired word, says that the only way sin can be taken away is through the shedding of blood. And the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it because they were not capable of, of uh, there's no real particular value as far as God is concerned in the blood of animals. And by the same token, when men sin, they put themselves beyond the ability to redeem themselves. The blood of a um, human is not sufficient to take away their sin because it's a sin against God. So the only thing that could take away sin would be the blood of God. And the only way that that could take place was for Christ to come in the flesh and to shed his blood so that the sin could be taken away. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter in verse 12, he used his own blood, not the blood of goats and bulls, for the sacrifice. He went into the most holy place and offered his sacrifice once and for all to free us forever. And so, because it was necessary for a blood sacrifice to be offered to take away sin, Christ made that sacrifice. His blood paid the price for our salvation. And as a result of that, we have the hope that we do because under the Mosaic law, blood had to be offered once a year for the, you might say, the postponement of payment for the sins of the nation of Israel. But Christ took the place of the sacrificial goat and he offered his blood in our place to take away our sin forever. So in this way, Christ fulfilled the law in all of its different standpoints from the prophecies that were made by the prophets all of these things were achieved and accomplished in Christ. And the end result is that mankind has an opportunity for salvation. And that, of course, is the way that he desired that we would go. And that was the purpose of which Christ came. We are told that Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so God provided the way that he had always intended. The golden rule is 
essentially a go away to eternity because it provides a way in which to be obedient to all of God's commands, to do the things that God would have done and to deal with every individual in the way that God would have them to be dealt with. And Christ's example, but his shedding of his blood, sacrifice was made and was approved essentially by God for the taking away of the sins of mankind. And so he opened the door from that particular standpoint and provided us a way of salvation. Christ essentially stands at the door and knocks today. If you're at the doorway and you're undecided about whether to become a member of the body of Christ, remember that the door is always available to you. Christ is always there, at least for the present. And if there are things, things in your life that you need prayers for in your behalf, we can also pray with you, as James 5 tells us. I pray for you for the help and the direction you need or the forgiveness that you might require. But if we can be of assistance to you in any way today, we invite you to let it be known. Come while we stand and while we sing. Uh, yeah.